Well, thanks a lot for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, as Mary said, I am a neurobiologist in essence, and I stumble into neuroinformatics and genomics. But I'm still a neurobiologist, so I teamed up with a Joseph Ecker, who is a genome ana a head of the genome analysis lab at the Salk Institute, and his then postdoc, Brian Lester, who is now a professor at the University of Western Australia, and Iran Mukamel, who is a computer scientist that was a postdoc with Terry Shinovsky, and he's now an assistant professor at UCSD in cognitive sciences. So, as this is kind of weird, as you all know, the sequencing of the human genome led or tried to lead to the identification of disease causing genes. This has been pretty good, and I should say it personally. A personalized medicine, advancing sequence technologies, and the foundation for the understanding of the blueprint of the human beings. However, we have learned also that DNA sequence on itself may only be half of the story. So you have, you can notice that variations in DNA alone may not, be, may not entirely account for the variations in phenotypic traits. And you have organisms like plant, insects, and mammals that show differences which you cannot find at as mutations at the level of DNA. And for instance, here is a Joe Ecker's preferred plant, Arabidopsis thaliana, where you have a phenotype that appears a, to delay the flowering of the a, plant. And this is due to an epi allele that gets methylated and thus delays the appearance of uh, the flowering. The same happens in bees, which to me was very interesting because all bees have the same genome and the workers produce the royal jelly, which is fed to the larvae for three days and then they stop. However, the queen gets this royal jelly for more days and very concentrated. And that is what leads to the formation of a queen. So they all start exactly the same. And recently it was found that it's a peptide that inhibits DNA methylation, what causes the uh, possibility for that royal jelly to induce a phenotype of a queen. And also we have in mammals, uh, the most common one is the epi allele that gives the agouti color, that is a transposone in a specific site in the genome of the mouse where it has an ectopic promoter and depending on how that, me uh, that promoter gets methylated, you get more or less of this gene and then you get the what is called a gooty color, which is sort of yellowish. It, as you can see here, it not only causes the coloring of the skin, but it also leads to obesity. So we have that one genome can lead, as you uh, know, to all the different cell types you have in an organism. And so this patterning from this single genome to all the different cell types is controlled uh, by transcriptional programs that are coded in the genome. And these transcriptional programs can be regulated and uh, we have, oops, sorry. We have uh, what we know, the transcription factors uh, that will bind and induce or repress a, a gene expression, non-coding RNAs that will do similar things, and we have epigenetic modifications, which means the modifications to the expression of the genome without altering 
the sequence of the genome itself. So there are layers on top of this genetic code. And those are usually uh, covalent modifications of DNA or histone that can modulate the readout of the uh, genome. So how can we study this? We can do it by sequencing, and these are all the different possibilities you have to study the different uh, modifications of the DNA. So the DNA sequences, you have it there, and you have transcriptional uh, that you can do by RNA-seq. You can do, a, analyze the, how the chromatin is exposed, which is usually related to an active state where it can uh, transcribe. The, also, the nucleosomes can be analyzed and the histones modifications and all this can be analyzed by different type of sequencing. And we are going to be talking mainly about DNA methylation and a little bit about histone modifications and chromatin accessibility which was not done by us, but by the ENCODE group, and we were able to use their uh, data for the analysis. So DNA methylation is modification of the cytosines in the DNA sequence by putting a methyl group. This modification has been related to Control of gene expression and differentiation of cells is essential for development. So if you knock out the enzymes responsible for putting these methyl groups in the DNA, you kill the organism. It's fundamental for silencing of transposons in the DNA. So it, it, one of the theories is that, in fact, it came upon by doing this, and then it was co-opted to do a gene regulation. But the original function of DNA methylation was silencing trans transposons so they cannot jump around. It's involved in X chromosome inactivation, and also it's involved in a cancer. So we have three players in, in this group, which are the ones that write the cytosine methylation, and these are two types of enzymes. The main one is DNMT1, which is the one that when DNA replicates, will go and put in the new cytosine a methyl group if the uh, parent strand, strand had the methyl group. And then we have the Nova uh, DNA uh, methyl transferases, which are the DNMT3A, 3B, and DNMT3L. And these ones will just put a methyl group on a cytosine without any uh, pre-pattern. Then we have an editing system, which is a, a modification of the cytosine by adding an, a hydroxy group, and that is 5-hydroxymethylcytosine, or 5-HMC. This is an important way of uh, taking out that methyl group. So if you want to regulate that methyl group, you can take it out. Uh, up until a few years ago, there was no way to demethylate in the mammalian brain, but it was recently shown that, in fact, these enzymes, the TET, which are oxidases, can add a hydroxy group 5-hydroxymethylcytosine, and that way oxidize to the back to the cytosine. And then you have the readers, and one of the most important readers, which are the methyl-binding uh, domain proteins, but one of the most important is MECP2, which is involved in Rett syndrome. How do you analyze epigenome by sequencing? You use a chemical trick. And so what you do is you shear the DNA just as if you were going to do high throughput sequencing to P 
pieces of about 100, 150 base pairs. You put adapters to it. But in this case, your adapters are fully methylated. So you make sure you have your, your adapters with methyl groups. Because then, what you do is you treat with bisulfite. And that, what, what it does is convert the cytosine to an uracil. And then this is read as a thymine, not as a cytosine anymore. So whenever you have a cytosine without a modification, you treat with bisulfite, you will convert it to a T. And so then you do your sequencing and you will get cytosines only on those ones that were methylated. You amplify, you do high throughput sequencing, and then you align your reads. And as you see, those cytosines that had a methyl group will uh, appear as cytosines. The rest will be appearing as thymine. So this requires that you convert your genome of your preferred genome. All cytosines need to be converted to thymines to be able to map. And then, so it's a bioinformatics uh, approach. What whole genome, uh, single base resolution sequencing uh, allows you is to see the context on which these uh, modifications of DNA happen. So, what we have uh, known is that cytosines get methylated in two broad contexts, and one is CG methylation, which is the most common, and you're probably gonna, whenever you read about methylation, you're gonna be reading about this type of methylation. A cytosine that is followed by a guanine in, gets methylated. This dimers, the methyl group is about 80% of the cytosines in the genome are methylated. There is another context, which is a cytosine followed by anything but a guanine, which is non-CG methylate. And that one is, a, up until now, it was considered rare in the mammalian genome, but we are gonna discuss a little bit more about it. And so this is the way you see it if you go to our browser, where you can align your genome with all the reads. Here you have the genes. I think this is chromosome two, a, a bit of chromosome two. You have your genes aligned there. Then you have the RNA coding for those genes. And then you have the, methyl, the methylation of this. Each tech here corresponds to a cytosine that has been methylated. So chromosome two, it's very compressed here. That's why you have so many genes. And in blue, you're gonna see non-CG methylation. Okay, so you can see that CG methylation is much more prevalent than the non-CG methylation. But our surprise was that uh, the brain does weird things. So you can zoom in at this point, which I did, is just clicking here to zoom in. And there you can see your cytosine that was methylated. One of these ticks. And is uh, simply, the color code is here. So when you find a cytosine in the read, it means that cytosine was methylated. So, Non-CG methylation was considered to be a weird thing that happened in plants only, but uh, Joe Ecker's group showed that, in fact, it's pretty prevalent in stem cells, where it corresponds to 24% of the cytosines in the genome. You have to think that the proportion is about 1 billion cytosines in a, new, in a genome. CG. C followed by G is only a proportion of it. The majority is C, non-CG uh, sites. So 24% of the genome is quite a bit. And what was interesting is that this happened only in stem cells, 
but not in fibroblasts. So when you, and they did several differentiated cells, and it looked like that the stem cells would contain these two forms of uh, DNA methylation, but when you differentiate, it disappears. And it, it was mainly in gene bodies, and the interesting thing also was that if you make a pluripotent cell starting from fibroblasts, so those are the IPS cells, the non-CG methylation that you find in the stem cell would reappear. So there is, it seems that methylation is functional. The methyl, as I said, the methyl group can be further modified. And uh, one of the important ones is the 5-hydroxy methyl cytosine. So this is done by the TET proteins, and it's a, a series of oxidations uh, where you get the 5-hydroxy, the formyl, and the carboxyl form that de uh, finally oxidizes to uh, release the methyl group that can be, again, methylated by the DNA methyl transferase. There are other uh, pathways here that I'm not going to talk about. But this form of a cytosine was known to be present in a, the brain. And it was an interesting... So with these tools, we went to approach the brain. And so... As you know, electrical signaling in neural networks uh, requires a, a sort of stable network. But this needs to be formed by cells that are, have very clear phenotypes, but also are flexible. That you need uh, cells in the brain not to change their phenotype, we know it because of if you have an alteration, for example, in an inhibitory neuron system, as it's the case of schizophrenia, you have a problem. And epilepsy is another example of changing the function of one of the neuronal systems. And, but and again, all, geno all neurons in the brain and glia share exactly the same genome. So we thought, one way of differentiating the cell types would be DNA methylation. And in fact, DNA methylation was, had been uh, related to the normal development of the brain as well as uh, neuropsychiatric disorders like autism uh, and Rett syndrome, Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia, and normal aging. So, our question were, was, what are the normal patterns of DNA methylation in the brain? Do they change to, during development, and how do they change? And are they cell type specific? So for this, we needed to separate the cell types. And to answer this, we did a whole genome sequencing. And we chose, and that was my decision, the frontal cortex, because that region is the slowest to develop in uh, mammals, and it's involved, uh, its alteration is involved in most of the neuropsychiatric disorders we know. So it's decision-making, executive function uh, seems to reside in this region. And as you know also, we have a high complexity of cells, but mainly in the, in the cortex we have Pyramidal neurons, inhibitory neurons, these correspond to 80% of the population, these are 20% of the population, but we cannot forget that they sum up only 50% of the population of cells in that region. The other 50% are glia. And so it's a mixture of cell types. And so what we did was to analyze the genome, the methylome patterns throughout the lifespan of both uh, mice and men, although there are a few women in between. But in, in general, it's mice and men. We have uh, repeats here of, uh, that are women. And we did the whole methylome, 
when I say methylome, is whole genome uh, DNA methylation to analyze the, the translation of that methylone changes, we did RNA-seq for the same uh, samples. We also separated cell types as neurons and glia, and for this, we isolate nuclei. So we produce nuclei and fact sort, nu n plus and nu n minus, because we are talking about uh, DNAs. And we also did a full a single base resolution of 5 hydroxy methyl cytosine to see where these changes were happening. This allowed us to do a series of uh, studies that, believe it or not, the sequencing took about seven or eight months, two and a half years of analysis. It was uh, tough a lot of dead ends. So it required a lot of imagination and creativity because this was 65 genomes. You have to think 3.3 billion base pairs, each of them, which you have to start comparing. Uh, so it took a while, but we got there. We are still analyzing. So what is the relationship of we can ask now, we have the whole genome, we can ask, is there any relationship between methylation of DNA and transcription? And so what we found, which was a very surprise, is that the, both the mouse brain and the human brain accumulate a non-CG methylation as they age. So in the... A fetal brain, you almost see none a, of the non-CG sites methylated. However, in the adult brain of both species, this accumulated pretty strongly. As a, we had seen in stem cells, surprisingly, in stem cells, sorry, a, in stem cells, this uh, correlated with increased gene expression. And that was a previous study that uh, Joe and, and Ryan had done. But in the brain, it correlates very nicely with gene repression. So the accumulation of non-CG methylation in the brain seemed to be involved in gene repre uh, repression. We also were able to analyze, since we had the whole structure, and we had data on um, DNA's hypersensitive sites, which allows you to know whether those uh, uh, certain parts of the genome are inaccessible to uh, modifications. And we found that non-CG methylation correlated very nicely with this uh, inaccessible regions of the brain, both the 5-hydroxy and the non-CG methylations, which seem to be deposited later on during development, cannot reach this inaccessible region. For ex just for you to know, this, this region that I'm showing here is the variable region of immunoglobulins, which is only active in uh, lymphocytes, which are the ones that express that uh, immunoglobulins. In, in the nervous system, it has to be shut down. And in fact, it is shut down, and it's shut down, the chromatin is like a knot. However, CG methylation in these regions is unaffected. So that is put when the cells are dividing very early on. Non-CG and 5-hydroxymethyl cytosine could not be added to those regions. So th those are inaccessible regions to uh, this modification. What was interesting to us was that when we went and looked, OK, when does the deposition of non-CG methylation happen during development? And we found that for both mice and men, 
the uh, accumulation of non-CG methylation occurs postnatal. What is interesting is that, as you know, in mice, the first postnatal week correspond to the third trimester in human. So, eye-opening eye would be birth for human. And as you see, it's only then that you start seeing the accumulation of uh, non-CG. And in the human, our first time point here was a, a 20 week gestation, and the next one is 35 a month uh, old. And this uh, accumulates throughout the childhood and adolescence. And it seems to correlate with the period of synaptogenesis when this is uh, increasing. DNA methylation had been implicated in brain development and plasticity in, uh, when analyzing very specific sites, BDNF or uh, FOS. And recently, another group did the study on dentigyro cells in the mouse and also found that non-CG accumulates throughout the development of the mouse at the time of synaptogenesis. So, who is doing this? So, we said at the beginning there are a four DNA, DNA methyl transferases, DNMT1, DNMT3A, 3B, and a 3L. We found that in neurons, as it had been shown before, DNMT1 and DNMT3A are the ones that are expressed in the adult a brain. The other two are, are more expressed in early, a, before the time point of our fetal sample. However, what we found was DNMT3A is induced right at the time when we see this increase in non-CG methylation, and it stays high for a, quite a while. Indeed, Data had shown that uh, when you knock out in the nervous system DNMT3A, the animals are born health healthy but start deteriorating very fast and they, and they die very soon. So the lack of DNMT3A early on allows the animal to be born, but unfortunately they only looked at motor neurons. I don't know if they did any other studies on that one but the, the animals die when they reach adulthood. And a, DNMT3A was found before to a, increase a, in the very early weeks of development and then a, go back down. And the double knockout, DNMT3-1 and DNMT... A, oui, I went too fast. The double knockout for these two enzymes a, has a pretty serious a, learning and memory deficit. So we are studying now the role of a, DNMT3A in a, synaptogenesis and how this could lead to alterations in behavior. So, all is well, who is expressing this non-CG methylation that seems to be involved in the uh, maturation of the brain, it's neuronal. When we separated the two cell types, the two main cell types in the, in the frontal cortex, we found that uh, in, in humans, it's astonishing. It's, it's almost more non-CG methylation than CG in the adult brain. And this are one or two are two biological replicas. And in the mouse, this is not as great as the human, but it's also is in neurons and very little in glia. And in this case, um, what we found was very interesting. If you look in fibroblast or in the fetal brain, there is almost no non-CG methylation. In the glia, 
there is a little bit. And so when we went to look in which part, which genes were showing this non-CG methylation, it was a subset of genes that had high methylation, uh, non-CG methylation. And those ones corresponded to a genes that are highly expressed in neurons and are involved in uh, synaptic plasticity. So, so, genes that get induced during synaptogenesis in the glial cells get highly methylated and repressed, suggesting that both neurons and glia are coming from the same precursor cells. So there is some fate determination in which the lineage of both in one needs to be told, you shut down, you're not going to become a neuron. So the CG methylation patterns were early on when the cells were defined as neuronal precursors. But then when these two go towards glia or neurons, you need another level of gene repression such that this cell does not forget it was supposed to be an astrocyte. And so, absolutely speculative, must recognize. But that is my way of thinking. And so, one of the questions in the, in the field was, well, is this 5-hydroxy five, five accumulation that is known occurs in the brain, is it the non-CG? that you guys are seeing. And so we went to look, and for this we, again, the, the enzyme responsible to put that 5-hydroxy in the uh, methylcytosine is the TET protein, so we went and did full sequencing for 5-hydroxy, which was not possible before. And this is using, a, again, a technique taking advantage of UDP to be able to add to the methyl group uh, using an enzyme, you, are, you add a glucose, and then you, you have modified the, the 5-hydroxy, and so the TET protein cannot recognize it and oxidize. And so what you do is you pick up your genome, add the, modify all the 5-hydroxys, uh, with this glucose, and then just add TET to the system. And that one will oxidize all five, uh, all uh, cyt uh, methyl cytosines to cytosines that upon bisulfate treatment are going to be converted to a thymine. But the 5-hydroxy got a glucose, and that cannot be oxidized. And so that way you can sequence it. And so we compared and uh, found out that, surprisingly, the one that gets the, the hydroxy is only CG. We could not find across the genome a non-CG non sites that would acquire a, a hydroxy. So it looks as if the TED proteins recognize the CG methylation. So there must be a sequence context for the recognition. Look, then we look also uh, to the inter-individual variability. It was so surprising how well conserved this accumulation of non-CG in, in mice and men that we said the position must be pretty uh, stable, and in fact it is. So you can see it here as the text or where, of where the non-CG methylation occurs. Here is for the whole population of humans and mice, and it's very high. Uh, and when you compare this between uh, here is the female and the male. The correlation is even better than for CG methylation, both in mice and in humans. And how does the 
gene body methylation change with a development. And so this is a busy slide, but uh, all I want you to look at is this is take all genes, do a k-means, arrange them by gene exp uh, site and a hundred kilobase upstream and downstream. Okay, so we are putting everybody under even big size, small size is relative. And you can see, that way you can see what is happening during development and at the cell type level for CG methylation and non-CG methylation. So you can see that there are a, in, genes that are constitutively high or highly expressed in neurons lose a DNA methylation in neurons in a development and a lose non-CG methylation in neurons. And I'm not going to detain too much. Then you have a um, astrocytic genes are highly repressed in neurons by adding CG methylation and non-CG methylation. So the same that we had seen for the astrocytes that turn off neuronal genes, the same happens in the neurons towards astrocytic genes. They shut them down with this type of methylation. And the glial cells resemble both for non-CG and for CG methylation closely to the neuronal precursor uh, cells. So what happens if we zoom in in this uh, demethylated regions and we go towards enhancers? And for this, you need to, and this is something that is a, an ongoing problem in genomics, is how do you find which is the way to look for differentially methylated regions? And there are tons of different algorithms to get to this, but uh, one, one of the ones that we used is this moving windows to find, since you have the, the genomes are fortunately the same, you can go and scan to see uh, methylation uh, levels. And so using this, uh, we could find that uh, there was very striking changes in specific regions that coincided with enhancers in during development. And so you have a CG islands, which is regions of the genome where you have a lot of CGs, higher than any, uh, any other place in the uh, uh, genome. Those are poorly methylated, and that was well known. The promoter regions and, and transcription uh, ending sites is usually pretty low, but the intragenic and the a active zones of a, a transcriptionally active a zones of the genome are the ones that show highest differential methylation as you go through development. And then when we looked and we compare a enhancer regions, and for this it was a different methods, but what is shown here is D DNA's hypersensitive side, which increases. So this is an enhancer that becomes active. Histone uh, methylation and acetylation is the same. That is none in the, in the fetal and becomes active. And if you go down here, you have that there was a 5-hydroxy in the middle 
of that enhanced region. And when you look in the whole genome, you find again that in a regions where there is a demethylation where between fetal and adult, you can find that 5-hydroxy in the center of the enhancer. You can look at it uh, again here where you can uh, see the sequence doing 5-hydroxy where you have a few that in the adult brain disappear and here you have the normal uh, MCG that cannot distinguish 5-hydroxy. Uh, now if you compile this and you look throughout the development and now many more uh, sites during the embryonic development, you see it's extremely dynamic. And uh, one interesting part was that these two clusters there seem to be demethylated exclusively in neurons. And so that to us represented a very interesting because it's an um, identifier. And so what we are doing now is to isolate neuronal types, not just the whole family of neurons, but single neuronal types. And for this, we are using a mouse line that was created by uh, Jeremy Nathans and Elisa Moy at John Hopkins that is a nuclear envelope protein that contains a GFP under a LOXP system. And you can cross it with a Cree line. And then you have these beautiful rings around the nucleus of the cell type expressing Cree. Okay? So, in this case, I just did uh, immunohistochemistry for uh, an inhibitory neuron, and you can see that there is no coincidence of the nuclear envelope with the cell type that should not uh, express it. And using this, we have uh, sorted this nuclei using uh, the GFP fluorescence, and we have found that for several uh, neuronal types, we can find very specific regions of the genome that change their methylation. So we are using these ones as identifiers now to be able to map the different cell types. So, for example, in uh, excitatory neurons, you remember you have your cortical layers. What differentiates those neurons? Why a neuron, besides the morphology and the positioning, what differentiates that neuron from uh, excitatory neuron layer four, for example? Well, we expect with this specific uh, methylation identifiers to be able to separate those different uh, type of neurons in the uh, cortex. And who is demethylating? That was the question. And so our RNA-seq was showing that the three TETs are expressed, but TET3 is the highest expressor in this region. So we deleted TED2. Well, we, we collaborated with someone that had made the knockouts for this one, and we analyzed the brains. And what we found was that both TED2 TED and TED3, and mostly TED3, uh, are involved in taking out those methyl groups from the specific sites in the brain in the genome. And so the regions that uh, increase their methylation or, or do not change during development did not show any effect on the uh, knockouts. However, the uh, TET2 TET or, or TET3 were hypermethylated in those regions that normally should have uh, decreased their methylation through development. And so the idea is that 
the TEDs will mark this uh, developmentally regulated uh, differentially methylated regions that will be active in the adult brain. But this requires a further oxidation by the TETs. In the TET knockouts, you will not be able to produce this uh, de further demethylation. So in summary, we have found widespread and dynamic differentially methylate methylation throughout the lifespan in two species. This, uh, we find the accumulation of non-CG methylation, specifically in neurons, that seems to be involved in gene repression. I didn't show this, but we also found very specific marks for a, a non-CG methylation involved in, in chromosome X inactivation. We produce the first whole genome, a five uh, hydroxy methyl cytosine uh, analysis. And this, using this, we found that in the fetal brain, you have in a poised state of specific cytosines that are going to be demethylated as you develop. And in many of them are in enhancers that become active in the adult brain. And you can find all this data, it's all public, and we have a friendly browser that you can read here, Neomorph at SOC. Just go there. This is only for the mouse, and we have everything in it. Sometimes it gets really slow, because it's too much data, but you have, you can browse there, you have the, the DMRs, the differentially methylated regions, the hypersensitive sites, the RNA-seq data throughout development, CG and non-CG methylation, and also the 5-hydroxy methyl uh, genome. And also the data is public and you can access it, uh, the raw data. You can access it, it at the geosite that is there. And with that, I want to thank all my colleagues in this adventure and uh, people from Manuel Esteller in Barcelona, Vic uh, Hagegi in Colombia, and Dr. Ho in Stanford that provided us some samples for the human brain. So this was the, 80, the 65, well, it was an 80-year-old woman that turned out to be a 65-year-old man, but uh, that was great. <laughs> but then uh, she provided us with the uh, male um, 53, year old uh, male, and, and Jana Rao provided us with the TED knockouts. And um, Dr. He was the one that performed the uh, TAP-seq to generate the 5-hydroxymethylcytosine. And of course, the ENCODE group for producing an enormous amount of data that we could use. And thank you very much. Mainly, I, I cannot hear you. <laughs> so, uh, if you could just clarify, does the methylation pattern keep changing as throughout the lifespan of, of a human? The, there is changes, but global, like this, it seems to be pretty stable. So it has a dynamic regulation as it develops when, once you reach adulthood. It more or less remains pretty stable overall. Specific sites, though, that is different. 
So uh, David Sweat has clearly shown under fear conditioning, for example, you have very clear changes in methylation in promoter regions, which are going to lead to increased expression of genes or decreased expression of genes. Those are transient then they come back. So that is one of the reasons why people believe the DNA methyl transferases and the TET proteins are so high in neurons. Normally in a differentiated cell, they are non-existent. However, in neurons, you still have both the methylation and the demethylation uh, systems present. So one of the possibilities is because there is a plasticity ongoing. That needs to, this type of change is slow. So it's not that you turn on a transcription factor and then rapidly turn it off, or a phosphorylation mechanism, which will be minutes of changes. This should last for a little longer. But would accumulation of these individual cell, I guess, cell level changes, could they, in principle, it, lead to senescence or, you know, long-term... That's one of the things that they have uh, been looking at. And so there is one isoform of DNMT3A, which they found related to cognitive decline uh, in aging. And you, we want to know when we make the knockout now, in a, at the time where non-CG methylation is accumulating, what does that produce at the level of synaptogenesis, at the level of behavior of the animal? So the, the knockouts that have been made before are either too early, and so they end up killing the animal, you have too much alteration, or it's too late. When the recombination happened, it, the non-CG accumulation already reached its uh, plateau, and so we still don't know. Is, is there any possibility of looking at single cell sequencing to perhaps detect the variation among cells of the same type? It's yeah, I have. You've, you've got there. But it hasn't. Involved with more dynamic processes in the brain, you know, long term memory or some such. Yeah. Um, single cell genome sequencing has not yet been possible. There are attempts, we are doing some. Uh, but it's, you cannot say much. It's, uh, remember, you have one copy of the genome, and it's very little. <laughs> uh, however, I, to this, I will add that this, the variability between the same type of cell in a nuclei may drive you nuts if you go single one and may not tell you much about what that nuclei in the brain is doing, because it's working as a group, it's a team. And so it will show you the variability that you can have. So that, that is, and so that is a little bit the fear that I have. My colleague, Joe Ecker, yes, single, single, and I say, oh, no. <laughs> we are gonna drown in data and in variance. And so it's a little bit, I, will, I, want, I want to go first to a group of the same type of neurons in a, in a specific region of the brain and get the means there. What are they doing and what is the difference from the same type of neuron in the same layer in the visual cortex and compare prefrontal with visual. And there, I think, we are going to get a little bit more an idea of what is the difference. Because if you go single, you may see too much. <laughs> uh, as I understand it, uh, some of the epigenetic uh, modulations that occur, changes that occur during life, can be passed on uh, to influence uh, the uh, phenotype of the offspring. Yeah. And uh, I wondered what your, I wondered if that's true uh, and what you think the implications might be for uh, inheritance of characteristics in the brain. Yeah, that is, uh, the, there are 
studies, and some of them are pretty good, but the best ones are when you see that the change occurs in the germline. So the environment produces changes that change the methylation in the germline, and those ones can be passed on. There is the maternal uh, one, which is uh, they have shown that the behavior of the mom in the first week of age of the animal can imprint a behavior in the female offspring that passes two generations. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's there, but it might be we need to go and look at the germ lines to see if something is, has been changed there. Lateral transfer of brain function, we would love it. 